It's Sunday night, and we're teaching on the doctrine of the devil. The Bible says over there, the verse we're using as a theme verse is 1 Timothy 4 and 1. The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith and give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. That word devil is the word daemonion. When it's translated to English, they translated it demon. Demon. Or you've got variations of the spelling. D-A-I-M-O-N, daemon. And whenever you find the word devil in a King James Bible, don't look for the word demon in a King James Bible. It's not there. The word devil is one of two words. KJV, King James Version, or AV, Authorized Version, which would be the, the TR, the Texas Receptus, where we get the King James. And devil will either be Diabolos, or it will be D-A-I-M-O-N-I-O-N, or it'll be a form of one of these. Uh, you have the word Damonizomai. Demonizomai. When Paul used the word superstitious in the 17th chapter of Acts, he was at Mars Hill, and he went out there to look at all of the, the plaques and the statues to all these gods, and then they had one that they came up with, and it said, to the unknown God. And Paul said, this is the one I want to talk to you about, to the one you don't know. Now, they worshipped they worshiped all these gods of the ancient world. They worshipped Hercules, Venus, Aphrodite. And I'm, I'm talking about, I'm talking about a mixture. What Hercules was called, in one state, he, he would be called uh, Jupiter or Adonis in another state, uh, meaning Lord. Adonis comes from Adonai, which is the Lord, and Lord was a common generic name. And all of these gods in the ancient world were called demons or daemonion. That's what they called them. Go back to Acts, the 17th chapter. We don't believe in demons here. I'm, I'm teaching, this is, I'm teaching on why we do not believe in demons. And this is part four. Part four, with, for the last four weeks, counting tonight, we're talking about why we don't believe in demons. I don't believe they exist. Because of definition and because of culture and history and the culture and the history of what they said they were. And we're going to talk about tonight why. We've already talked about this once, and this will be the second in the series of this. Why we do not believe that fallen angels... are sons of God or why they're not demons. Now, there's several reasons why we don't believe they're demons, and that's out of Genesis 6 chapter. Several reasons. First of all, fallen angels can't be sons of God, mainly because to be a son of someone, son of, that would be a word expressed in the Greek, bar. Simon, blessed art thou, Simon, bar Jonah. Bar means son of, son of. Uh, that is not talking about over there in Matthew, the 16th chapter. It's not talking about Peter's father being Jonah. Jonah 
God came to Jonah and said he wanted him to go preach to Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital city of the Assyrian Empire. That's on the Tigris River. And Jonah takes off, runs this direction, and jumps on a ship, goes down to Joppa, which is down uh, on the Israel coastline, gets on a ship and takes out in the sea. He doesn't want to go over here to Nineveh, which is the capital city of the Assyrian Empire. This is Assyria up in here. Assyria is northern, northern Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia means between the rivers. That's what the word means. It's an ancient word. And it's between the Tigris and the Euphrates River. It's what we call Iraq today. That's Mesopotamia. Another name is Haran. Uh, another name is Sumar, S-U-M-A-R. These are all names. Or Babylon. You can pick, take, take your choice. Sumar, Haran, Babylon, Iraq. And boy, there's so much in these names. I don't even have time to go into them. Even your scientists will tell you that all life began in the Sumerian, not Samaria. This is Samaria, northern Israel over here. That's not Sumar. Sumaria. The Sumerites were said to be where all life began. Well, that's true because when you look at the second chapter of Genesis, the Bible teaches that God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And Eden, the measurement of Eden was from the great river of Egypt to the Tigris-Euphrates region. So eastward in Eden would be over here somewhere around the Persian Gulf. Above that in this area right here where they found the ruins of Nimrud, N-I-M-R-U-D, and this is where the Babylonian civilization was, and that was a reinstitution of Adam and Eve worship. So east in Eden would be over here. When you look at the original boundary of Israel, it was between the great river of Egypt and the Euphrates. So this was actually Israel. This was actually Eden. And a garden east in Eden would be over here. When you look at the definition of those rivers in that second chapter. Now, where was I going? Somewhere. All right. We're talking about demons, why we don't believe in them. And uh, I started to say something. Uh, well, this is where the demons began. This is where they begin over here. All worship in the world is ancestor worship. You can read any number of books by historians. Now, I've got... I bring different books all the time. I brought two books on fairies. This is not fairy tales and fairy stories. This tells you about the origins of fairies, where they came from. And when you're reading in here, you'll read. Let me just read one little phrase to you right here. Just a phrase. And this will show you what, uh, what they're talking about. All right, I'm just going to read this right here. Animistic origin of belief in pixies. Now, fairies. There were good fairies and bad fairies. There were good demons and bad demons. When America thinks of a demon, they think of something evil, don't they? Well, that's not what a demon necessarily was. They had good and bad demons. They had good and bad fairies. And that's what the Celts called, what the Jews called demons. Demon means to distribute fortunes. One fellow said, we well, only find that one place. No, you haven't read enough places. Mr. Strong says it means to distribute fortune. Mr. Hastings says, if you're distributing fortunes, anyone who preaches a distributing fortune doctrine is preaching the doctrine of the devil, the doctrine of demons. That's Kenneth Copeland. He says, God wants to distribute fortunes to you. And when you read in the... Uh, I've got sections here. When you read the 
section out of Hastings on spirits and demons, it'll tell you one who apportions. That a demon is one who, an apportioner, one who measures out or meets out money or stuff or things. Well, when Satan took Jesus upon a high mountain in Luke 4 and Matthew 4, they're the, both the same account, Satan said, fall down and worship me, I'll give you the fortunes of the world. When you look at the word, daemon, and there's a prefix that goes with that. Some of the writers tell us, U-D-A-I-M-O-N, eudaemonism. Some say that Thomas Jefferson, Jefferson put his approval upon something called eudaemonism, which means well or good demon or good demon. When you look up eudaemonism in Hastings Encyclopedia of Religion, let me read this to you. Hastings is that 13-volume set I've got over there. Let me read to you. I think I've got it here. Yeah, let me read to you. Eudaemonism means a good demon. It means the best, the most profitable system for the most number of people. That's what Jefferson started America on, eudaemonism, and they will tell you that, these historians. Eudaemonism may be defined as the theory that the ethical end, the ultimate object to be achieved by action and conduct, the standard and final tra tra criterion of what ought to be is welfare, and they've got in parentheses eudaemonia. They're saying that welfare is eudaemonism. It is the best for the most people. Welfare is not to be regarded as identical with happiness, although the latter term has been widely and even generally employed as a rendering of the Greek word which welfare more truly represents. Happiness may, of course, be so defined and understood by a moral philosopher as to become the technical equivalent of welfare or Aristotle called it eudaemonia, or eudaemonism. Then he says, eudaemonism finds its typical exponent in Aristotle, whose famous definition of welfare, Aristotle's definition long before Jesus was eudaemonism, the good demon. In the first century, Augustus Caesar was called the good demon, the eudaemon, because... He was distributing the fortunes to the Roman Empire, and he was considered to be a good Caesar, a good demon. They had good demons and bad demons. These are just some of the reasons we don't believe in demons. Eudaemonism, or welfare, or man's ultimate good. I've got a, a biography of Thomas Jefferson, and the writer says that Thomas Jefferson was seeking the welfare of what was best for the most number of people in America. That's called welfare, or the old ancient Greek term is good demon. Now, we don't believe in that here. Let me, and then, of course, it tells you to see utilitarianism. See utilitarian. Let me see here. I think I've got that here somewhere. Yeah, let me read this. Utilitarianism. Let me write this on the board. So we put eudaemonism. This is old, ancient, cultural sayings. Now, utilitarianism, U-T-I-L-A-A-R-I-A-N-I-S-M, utilitarianism. Now, let me read this to you. Under eudaemonism, it tells you to read this, and that's out of Hastings over here. People say, well, the Bible says there's demons. No, it doesn't. You have to go and study the culture of the first century. The term utilitarianism is used for both an ethical theory and practical movement. The practical movement will be dealt in it with under the article below. As an ethical theory, it signifies that the ultimate end and ought to be general happiness and that these actions 
or right which bring the greatest happiness to the greatest number of people. That is what Jefferson founded this country on. The greatest happiness, that's called, that's an ancient word called eudaemonism. That's one reason we don't believe in demons. Capitalism, when you read capitalism, demon means to distribute fortunes. While I'm doing this, let me read to you out of a Webster's Dictionary. Let me just read the definition of capitalism. Capitalism is where people have a right to go down here and start their business and uh, make money and have free enterprise. Well, it doesn't work. Men get filled with greed. The more they get, the more they want. They get to fight and they get to competing with each other. And it gets very wicked and very evil. Now, capitalism. Let me read this to you. Remember, daemonion means to distribute fortunes. Is not the love of money the root of all evil? Yes, it is. Capitalism. Now, I went through this about three years ago. And in this demon series, I haven't been through it in a long time, so some people will hear me say something about, we don't believe in demons. Well, the Bible teaches there. No, it doesn't. They lived in a culture where they were superstitious. They said they had demons, but Jesus never agreed with it. I mean, let me read this to you. C-A-M-N-O-P, capitalism. Now, remember, may I remind you, demon means to distribute fortunes. To a portion. In fact, I've got one paper here that Willie gave me by a fellow, and he says, Hornblower on Daemonase. Etymologically, the term daemon means divider or one who allots money or fortunes. That's what it means. Capitalism. An economic system in which all or most of the means of production and distribution, it comes from the word distribute, doesn't it? As land, factories, communications, and transportation systems are privately owned. The word private in the Greek is the word idios. It means self-owned. We're talking about distributing to self and operating in relatively competitive environment through the investment of capital to produce profits, money. You say, Jim, if that don't work, America was founded on a wicked system, eudaemonism, which is capitalism, which is demonism. I told a lawyer here in town one time, uh, he died here a while back. He's my age. He got hurt and some infection set in and he died. And uh, I told him, I said, Carl, Capitalism is evil and wicked. He said, well, certainly it is. He was a historian. He studied history. He said, certainly it is. That's what my business is about, suing one another. Yes, it's evil. And I said, democracy votes and votes for two men that they trot out in front of you and say, pick the one that's telling the truth. Whoever said a Republican or a Democrat was telling the truth. They bring a, a 10-foot... Diamondback rattlesnake out, and they bring out a king cobra and say, which one you want to sleep with tonight? They're all there for money and power. I do not believe that these politicians are there for anything but money and power. How can you prove that? Well, yes. If they would come up and say, you can be a senator, you can only serve two terms, and when you go to Washington, we have an efficiency apartment for you, and we'll give you thirty, thirty-five thousand a year, and give you a gasoline allowance of uh, uh, three thousand a year. You think anybody's going to go there for that? And when you get home, you cannot use your political powers to make money. You know, when those guys come back home, they make tons of money by putting their name on building projects and everything else. All they have to do is go in and meet with a bunch of contractors, and they'll say, if we can stick your name on this, we'll give you 15% of all the proceeds, and you don't have to do a thing. When Howard Baker, who used to be Senate Majority Leader, Republican, and he was from Tennessee, when he came back to Tennessee, he was powerful. That's what it's about. It's about power. They like it. I don't believe they're working for the people. I believe they're working for themselves. Wouldn't vote for a Republican or Democrat. 
I'd just as soon crawl in bed with a king cobra or a 10-foot diamondback rattlesnake. Don't believe in them anymore. Who do we vote for? The church. Who are we patriotic to? The church, spiritual Israel. That's who we're... Paul said, what do I have to do to judge those who are without? That means outside of the church. What do I have to do? You mean I'm going to elect a Caesar for Washington or a Pharaoh for Washington? No. Well, do you care what they do? No, I don't. Do you care if we go to war? No, I don't. you care about the soldiers? Yes, I care about those guys. They're being used by the nation, but... Babylon was founded on self. Babylon is the mother of all it. She was founded on let us make us a name. Well, is America a let us make us a name system? Yeah. Well, yeah, it is. So when we're over there bombing Iraq, what we're doing, we're over there bombing our mother, aren't we? It's bad Babylon bombing Babylon. And there is no answer to all this. Now, I was reading to you utilitarianism. Let me read this. As an ethical theory, it signifies that the ultimate end is and ought to be general happiness and that these actions are right which bring the greatest happiness to the greatest number. When you read in the Constitution, Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness, when you read Richard Schinkman, who is a historian, doctorate in history, Research for the Library of Congress. He's got these bestsellers out. Uh, he's got these bestsellers like uh, Cherish Lies and Myths of American History. That's one book. I love Paul Revere, whether he wrote or not. I like that because that's talking about things in our American history that's not true. It didn't happen the way that we were told. I'm, I'm reading a book on history, historians on history. I was reading it, a line in the book I read the other day said, uh, history is not a search for truth. It is a search for the opinion of the historian who wrote it or his political leanings because everyone is prejudiced or partial. If it's a right-wing Republican, he takes a right-wing Republican approach. If it's a left-wing Democrat, he takes a liberal approach. We've got a fellow that come here that was a retired colonel, and he said, whoever wins the war gets to write the history. So that's the way it works. We won, so we get to write the history about, about America and Revolutionary War, about the War of 1812, uh, about the Civil War, about the war in Vietnam. We get to write since we're powerful and big. But it didn't turn out. That, it never has been that way. Whenever you read, especially you read these guys like Shankman, he's kind of funny. Let me read the rest of this. So utilitarianism has the same meaning as eudaimonism. As an ethical theory, it signifies, oh, wait a minute, I already read that. The greatest happiness principle holds that actions are right in proportion as they tend to promote happiness. Jefferson said, life, liberty, and the suit of happiness does not mean they didn't mean when they wrote that in the Constitution a happiness for everybody. He says when they said they believe that all men are created equal, he said that's not what the founding fathers meant. He said what they meant, if they meant that, then why did they keep black men in slavery? Jefferson said he didn't believe in slavery. He got all kinds of things saying that, but he says I can't run my nail factories without them, so I have to keep them. Jefferson was a heathen. So he says, they didn't mean, he said, what they meant when they said all men are created equal. He said, all men are created equal within the boundaries where they are limited. The black man can go as far as he wants to within the boundaries where he's limited to go. He can go to the edge of that boundary, but he can't go over here where the white man can go. He said, they didn't mean what they say in the Constitution. And the God they speak of in the Constitution cannot be especially the Declaration of Independence, which Jefferson wrote, and he plagiarized from a, it was either North Carolina or Virginia, he pulled their constitution out of their state and plagiarized that. He didn't mean that God. 
Jefferson was a deist. A deist is a person that believes in a God out there somewhere. He spins all this in orbit, puts the earth out here, spins the moon around it, puts us all in this ecliptic path around the sun, and then says, okay, it's yours, you take care of it. That's a deist. He didn't believe in no trinity. We were not founded on Christianity. We were founded on new demonism, good demonism. When you research this, people that say they believe in demons, they haven't researched this stuff. Let me read this. By utilitarianism is meant, it comes from the word utility. A utility room is where you have things that you need and you use, and it's for the good of the people. By utilitarianism is here meant the ethical theory first distinctly formulated by Bentham that the conduct which under any given circumstance is objectively right is that which will produce the greatest amount of happiness on the whole. If it produces happiness on the whole for all of America, then it's right is what he's saying. You mean this smooth, easy talk, this, this uh, political correctness is Christianity? No, it's not. Roman Catholicism was founded on that very thing under another name. Political correctness is called tolerance, isn't it? And when Constantine started Roman Catholicism, he issued, a, a, he issued an edict of toleration throughout the world. It was called the Edict of Milan. And he said, we've had problems with Christians and pagans throughout the world so what we're going to do is start tolerating each other. We're going to invite all the Christians into the church, all the pagans into the church. We're going to start a new system, and we're going to tolerate one another, and we're going to take the gods of the pagans, the Celts, the Gauls, the, the Vandals, the Huns, and the list goes on and on, and we're going to bring them, their tree and sun worship in the church bring the Christians in the church, tell everybody to keep their mouth shut, tolerate one another, and have political correctness, and we're going to, rain, we're going to rename this new system Christ Mass. And the Mass is the very focal point of Roman Catholicism, raising the Eucharist up and saying, hoc is corpus in fili, and it turns into the literal body and blood of Christ. All that fire worship came out of Babylon, out of Sumar, out of Haran, out of Babylon, out of Iraq, whatever you want to call it, Mesopotamia. Between the rivers, and that's where life started. That's where Babylon was built, on the Euphrates River. Now, all right, let me get on with this. I've got so much in Why we don't believe in demons? One more time, let me write it on the board for you. Let me get me a pen that works. Some of these are about to give out. The kids come up here and draw with them after church, and I want them to. And they entertain themselves, and that's fine. I just got to get me a new one. All right. All right. Now, why we don't believe in demons? It's eudaemonism, number one. Now, there's many reasons why we don't believe in demons. I started to show you this. I was going to read this to you. What the Jews called demons. The Jews called demons. The same thing. And the Jews said demons would distribute fortunes. Augustus Caesar was called a, a eudaemon, a good demon. They had good demons and bad demons. All of this has evolved into our century. They had good fairies, good fairies. They had good and bad fairies. And these good and bad, a fairy gives you your wishes, doesn't it? And they had bad fairies. And then you had demons. And then you had genies. This is what the Arabs call genies. I'll spell it like that. It's actually G-E-N-I-I, -I, or gen, plural. And genies, this is what the, I got it in the wrong 
column, genie. This is what the Arabs called the same thing that the Jews called demons and the Celt calls fairies. And a genie gives you your wishes. Wishes. And then you had what the uh, Greeks called guardian angels. Guardian angels are not necessary to God, first of all, because God has declared the end from the beginning, and from ancient times, everything is not yet done. Why does he need somebody to help him? Can God do it all by himself? Oh, yes, sir, Ray. So Greeks call them guardian angels. Then you're going to find this in Hastings, and you're going to find it in McClinic and Strong. You're going to find it in these books. Usually they will say, if you're studying Jenny, they'll start talking about guardians. If you're studying demons, they'll start talking about guardians. If you're studying fairies, they'll talk about guardians. They'll intermix that all through. Let me read this, just one paragraph to you. Animist, animistic origin of belief in pixies. You had, you had pixies, brownies, gnomes, trolls. These were all fairies. The trolls were going to get you. Those are bad. Those were bad demons or bad fairies. Uh, some of them were good and some were bad. And all of this comes up to our current day. All that has gone through an evolutionary process so that when you see a Bugs Bunny cartoon, you got an angel on one shoulder or on the right shoulder, he's whispering in the right ear, and a little demon-looking thing with a little red suit whispering in the other ear, that's the good and the bad demon. And what's so funny is they've got a, a halo or a sun god up on the head of the little angel on the right shoulder. Isn't it crazy? Or you'll see the Priceline commercial with Captain Kirk, with, uh, what's his name? Shatner. William Shatner. And he's in there. He's got on a beard, but it's light color and light colored hair. And all of a sudden, he comes breaking through the wall as a bad demon with the black hair and the black beard, doesn't he? That comes out of the same system as... They don't know that's where they adopted it, but it come out of that whole system of good and bad demons. People today say there's only bad demons. Well, if you're going to go back to the first century, you've got to have good ones and bad ones. And I've never seen any of them. Then he goes on to say, I should say that the modern belief in pixies or in fairies arose from a very ancient Celtic or pre-Celtic belief in spirits, just as among some savage tribes, there is a belief in gods and totems. And all through this book, they'll talk about totems. American Indian. Indian. Calls the same thing totems. And totem means kin folk. Kinfolk. Well, are these actually kinfolk that started at Babel? All that demons are, they're a deification. Deify means to make somebody a deity or a god. How many gods are there? One. If you believe in demons, everywhere you go, you're going to find they say they're deities. Well, if they're deities, they're gods. If they're gods, they're false gods. And everywhere you find the word demonion, it's neuter gender. Every time you find the word angel in the New Testament, it's masculine gender, A-G-G-E-L-O-S. That's why demons can't be fallen angels. Angels neither marry nor are given in marriage. And I don't know whoever came up with the idea that God had to give angels reproductive systems, male genitalia, so they can reproduce children. Where'd that ever come from? You mean God gave them genitalia and gave them seed or sperm so they can reproduce children and make them giants? Whoever come up with that? Where does the giant thing come from out of Genesis 6? 
It comes out of Ginsburg's Legends of the Jews. I've got a seven-volume set of Legends of the Jews, and they will tell you that these giants supposedly were fallen angels come down from heaven and that they were 3,000 L's, E-L-L-S, tall. When you take the Webster's Dictionary, look up L, E-L-L. It will tell you in here that an L is approximately 45 inches. Therefore, these giants were 11,200 feet tall. Pikes Peak is about 19,000 feet tall. That's Pikes Peak in Colorado Springs. In other words, they are two-thirds the height of Pikes Peak. Now, how in the world are they going to intermarry with women? Is that dumb? That is a stupid theology. Don't listen to anybody that says demons are fallen angels. It's ridiculous. And they produce giants. I don't know how in the world they can cohabitate together, much less how she can cook for a giant like that. She has to go down here to the Titan Stadium in Nashville and say, I'm going to fix you some soup, dear. I'll fill up the stadium with soup for supper. It's outrageous the things that people believe. Listen to this. Fairy guardians of men are told. At the men I'm told, there is supposed to be a guardian fairy or pixie who can make miraculous cures. The demons were supposed to be able to cure you, not make you sick if they were a good demon. I'm not going to read any more of that. That goes on and on and on. I've got another book here. Gnomes, fairies, elves, and other little people. This doesn't mean they're lucky charms fairies. It means they are evil and wicked. They can do these evil things. Some of them are giants. Some of them are small. And it, they go into here and go through totems, the whole works. When Jesus said, this kind, kind goeth not out by, by prayer and fasting, did Jesus believe that they had an ancestor in them there in the 17th chapter of Matthew, the word kind is the word genos. Genos means kinfolk. Where they got all of these systems, they deified their ancestors. It's the same thing as Shintoism. I remember from the time I was a little kid believe, no, hearing that Shintoism was ancestor worship. Every bit of its ancestors, the Jews said, demons were their ancestors. The Celts said fairies were their ancestors. The Arabs said genies. The word genie comes from the word gene. And they intermix all of these all through the scriptures. Let me read something to you. I said a while ago there is a variation of this word daemonion. It's the word daemonizomai. Daemonizomai. That word demonizomai, when you see possessed with devils. Every time you find that, it is one word. It's the word demonizomai. That's what it is. I, I didn't finish what I was going to finish a while ago. Let me hold this and finish this in just a second. Because this is going to go with this. Look over here in, I, I was going to take you to Acts 17 a while ago. Acts 17. You know, I don't even know how, to, Mary said one time, can't you teach this with some kind of organization? I just have to pitch it all at you. Here's some, here's some, here's some, here's some. The amount of information is so phenomenal. Look in Acts. Paul gets to Mars Hill in Athens. He's on his journey over here, and he's in that, he leaves on his second missionary journey in the 15th chapter. He's still on his second missionary journey when he gets to Athens. He gets over to Athens, and he goes outside the city to Mars Hill. He, here he comes this way up here. Goes down here. Gets to Athens. Mars Hill is where they have all of these statues to their gods and that they worship. 
in here in this 16, 17th chapter of Acts, when I flipped too far, 17th chapter, he gets to Mars Hill, and here's what they say to him. Demons are gods, but there's no such thing as another god. Therefore, they're mythological gods. They're Hercules and Adonis. And all Hercules and Adonis was was a deification of Nimrod. In every city-state, Nimrod was deified as a sun god or, a, or his counterpart uh, was, uh, was deified as a tree goddess or a moon goddess. Now, he's here at Mars Hill. He comes to Athens. Verse 18, then certain philosophers... Of the Epicureans, these were philosophers. The Epicureans were believers that all of the all of the uh, gods they needed was in their belly. When we think of an Epicurean, we think of a connoisseur of good foods, don't we? They said the two most popular philosophies of the day was Epicureanism and Stoics. The Epicureans said all that they needed was the essential fulfillment of their belly. When Paul uses the word belly, that's an Epicurean term. These men serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. Epicurean is what it is. He, would say some, he said there in the third chapter of Philippians, some men hate the cross of the Christ because their God is their belly, an Epicurean term. Do you think when he was writing to Philippi, they didn't know about Epicureanism? It was rampant through, their, through the whole uh, civilized world or so-called civilized world. Then he goes on to say, Certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics, Stoicism was started by a man named Zeno. It had been going on for over 350 years when Paul wrote this. It was very popular in the world. The Stoics encountered him and said, What will this babbler say? Others some. He seemed to be a setter forth of strange... They interpreted the word gods, but the word is daemonion in the Greek text. He seems to be a setter forth of strange gods because the pagans believed that daemonion was interchangeable with the word theos. Theos is the word God. When we speak of theology, it comes from theos and logos. It means a study of the word of God. So the pagans said daemonion and theos, which is the word, Greek word God, were interchangeable, so they interchange it right here. He's a setter forth of strange demons. And they said that was their God. Because he had preached unto them Jesus. That was a strange demon to them. And the resurrection. Then he goes on down here. In verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive in all things that you are too superstitious that made all of these gods, and they had them all out there on Mars Hill. Superstitious is the word DC. Look here. D-E-I-S-I, D-E-I-S-I, D-A-I-M-O-N. E S T E R O S. DC Diamonesteros. If you notice, Daemon is in the middle of that. DC Diamonesteros. Comes from Delia, D E I L I A, and D A I M O N I O N. Delia means timid or fear. It means a fear of the gods. What he's saying, what you've done is you've made all these idols to all these gods and you're afraid you're going to miss one, so you made one to the unknown god. We want to make sure we get them all. Jim Brown will believe what you're saying about demons and predestination and Christmas is pagan, but we're going to hold on to Billy Graham too, just in case he might be right, just in case you're wrong. That means you can't make up your mind and you're double-minded and you're unstable in all your ways. Some people can't believe definition when they hear it. Did you know there's a lot of weak people at Grace and Truth, and they can be swayed by people that have no definition because they're smooth talkers? Did you know that? Some people here cannot make up their minds. 
you have to learn to be assertive, like Luther said. Be assertive. Say, here's the meaning of the word. Deal with it. Now, so that word delia is the same word when Paul told Timothy, concerning men, Timothy, stir up the gift that's in you. It's been given to you by your grandmother Lois, by your mother Eunice. And he said, stir up this gift, for God hath not given us the spirit of delia, being timid towards men. Go out and preach to men. Don't be afraid of them. It's not the common word fear, phobeo, P-H-O-B-E-O. We get our word phobia from that. And when the ninth chapter of, of Hebrews speaks of Moses coming near the mountain of God, and the Bible says he was ek, he was frightened out of his wits, ek phobeo. It means frightened out of his wits, frightened out. He was saying, not supposed to fear God. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The Old Testament, where does the word yare, Y-A-R-E? means to quake in fear. It has the same meaning as phobeo. That don't mean a phobia like I'm afraid of elevators. That means you're frightened out of your mind. All right. Let me set some of this aside. Now, why we don't believe in demons? I got all kinds of information on this. Let me move some of this. Why we don't believe in them? If you believe in demons, according to Hastings, you have to believe in all the rest of this because it is a totem pole is a family pole. When they had a totem pole, they, have, they would have a, if they had a wolf on top, then they had an otter, then they had a deer, and then they had a, a mountain lion or a cougar, or, and the list goes down. Whatever family you were with, if the wolf was the family of your tribe, then that wolf protected you. He was a guardian, and he looked after you. That was what the totem pole was for, and you never killed a wolf. You didn't hurt a wolf because he was one of your ancestors guarding you. He was a guardian spirit, just like the Jews had guardian demons. The Celts, they were the good demons. They had guardian fairies, guardian genies, guardian angels, totems, and the Roman Catholic called them patron saints. And the, they get their patron saints out of these, these guardians, and St. Nicholas was the patron saints of children. Did he distribute fortunes to them? Yes. Took them toys. Of course, some... Historians say that St. Nicholas was a pedophile. That's why he had toys for kids, giving them toys. St. Nicholas, I wrote an article on St. Nicholas for, and I called him a demon. And when I put it in the paper, I put all those tracks in the paper as I wrote them, the local paper, and they called me down to the uh, newspaper. And they said, Mr. Brown, we can't put this in the newspaper. You're calling St. Nicholas a demon. We'll have to put a disclaimer on it. I said, good, put a disclaimer on it. So they, so they set it up. They said, it looked like we're calling him a demon. This way they can't sue us. If they sue anybody, it'd be you. I said, that's fine. And I had, and of course, they're all like this. And up here, they put advertisement. <laughs> I said, that's fine. I don't care. I love disclaimers because... If I tell Mike, put disclaimers on all our TV programs. The, the message of Grace and Truth Ministries is not necessarily the, the opinions of this station broadcasting. That way, say, be careful what you watch here. And that way, people will say, I wonder what that guy's saying. <laughs> and if they're elect, they'll go, let's go check him out. And if they're elect, they'll say, yeah, that's true. I love disclaimers. Tell people I'm lying. Uh, I've had people say, I'm going to... I'm going to expose you. I said, good. Be sure and tell them not to watch the guy on TV on Monday night on Channel 176 <laughs> on Combat. Tell them, don't watch him. He has some bad things to say. That way, if they're elect, they'll say, I wonder what he's saying. We're only looking for the elect anyway, aren't we? And the elect have hearing ears, don't they? So I always tell people, be sure and tell them what station I'm on not to watch it. 
I always give them the time and station. If you're going to tell somebody, say, that guy on Saturday night on Channel 176, do not watch him at 10 o'clock on Channel 176. And people will watch just to see what I'm saying. And the elect will hear it. Now, many reasons. Let me give you something here. Possessed with demons, possessed with demons, Damonizomai means insane. Now, I'll read this to you in a minute. Well, when you go to Matthew, the 8th chapter, Mark, the 5th chapter, Luke, the 8th chapter, you've got the man of the Gadarenes. Man of the Gadarenes. Well, you've got two of them here. You only got one here and one here. Well, does that mean the Bible is contradicting itself? No. That means that Jesus is only dealing with one of them here. It says two come out to meet him here, but it only speaks of one here. That means Luke's account and Mark's account, he's just dealing with one of the men. But there are two of them there, or there are two demons, two men. And when the demons spake to Jesus, the two men spake to him. That's what it is. But you only get the two men out of Matthew 8. You not only get the two men out of here or out of here. And the Bible says in Luke the 8th chapter and Matthew the 8th chapter and Mark the 5th chapter, the man was possessed with demons. Well, let's go to Luke the 8th chapter. Luke 8. Luke 8. All right. Luke the 8th chapter. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. I'm just going to tell you. People say, what was it that went into the swine? It was the desire to fulfill self. I believe Jesus is saying, this man had an imagination going on in his mind. First of all, he was dwelling among the tombs, and he was naked. Does it take a crazy man to go live in a cemetery and be naked? Yes, it's got to be crazy, doesn't it? He was nuts. The Bible says he was nuts. Now, Luke 8. After Jesus cast out, people say, God wouldn't cast the desire for self in animals. It's so completely unnatural for a person to be in himself to such a degree he has this overwhelming desire to fulfill himself and he'll just get so stressed and bent out of shape that he gets angry and furious and has anybody been there besides me? Huh? You ever been there? It's a terrible place to be. And it drives you literally out of your mind wanting what you want so bad. I wanted to be a star so bad when I was in my 20s. I had a great singing group. Why can't we have what we want? I said about my dog Susie, she was about 16, 17 years old. I told my band, we were rehearsing one day, I said, if Susie had in her what I have in me, she would kill herself. And I hadn't studied demons to that degree yet. It, you have to understand, right before this, Jesus is out here with the winds and the water, and he's in a boat, and a storm is there, and he goes, stands up and goes, shh. And the wind behaves, stops. You see, he speaks to inanimate objects. He speaks to snow in the 37th chapter of Job. Snow be on the ground, and it is. Yes, I know that it all happens with ice crystals and barometric pressures and atmosphere and all this, but who do you think brings those winds and those together and the atmosphere and all the particles that it takes to make snow drop? God says, I speak to the snow and say, snow, be on the ground, and it is. When people die in a snowstorm, that is God. Now, he's talking to this man, and in verse, let me really make this clear to you. Verse 33, the demonion went out of the man and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the lake or into the sea. Always when Babylon falls, she goes into the sea in Revelation 18, Jeremiah the 51st chapter. 
this destroying mountain, or when God says, I'm going to make you a burning mountain there in the 8th chapter of Revelation, God says the mountain was cast into the sea. The swine go down into the sea or into the lake. Babylon sinks into the Euphrates or into the sea in Jeremiah, the 51st chapter. And in Revelation, the 18th chapter, she sinks into the sea like a stone. When you say to this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea. Notice that every time it happens. In a mountain, Babylon was a mountain of pride or self, and Peter and John were arguing with Jesus about killing a fruit tree. It was against Jewish law to kill, kill fruit trees unless it was five years old or older, not bearing fruit. And Jesus was God, and he knew how old the fig tree was. And he killed it because it wasn't bearing fruit according to Luke, Leviticus, the 19th chapter, but the last two verses of the of the 20th chapter of Deuteronomy, the Bible says it's against the law to kill fruit trees unless it's five years old or older, not bearing fruit. And Jesus tells Peter and John, you got a mountain of Babylon in you. Be thou say to your say to this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea. So they run down into the sea, and when they had fed them, saw what was done, they fled and went and told it in the city and the country. Then they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils, the demonion, were cast. Now, here's what happens when self goes out of these bodies of ours. Sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed, and in his right mind. So for nail. Same. That means before the demon was cast out, he was possessed with demons, and that means to be insane. I have been so into myself, it's nearly driven me crazy. You ever been there? Wanting what you want? And it says here in, in verse 36, well, let's read down to it. In his right mind, they were afraid. They also, which saw it, told them by what means he that was possessed with Daemonion was healed. Healed? What do they mean, healed? Sozo, saved. <laughs> That's the word sozo, S-O-Z-O is pronounced D-Z. Sozo, saved. Well, every time Jesus would say to someone, thy faith is made thee whole, faith makes whole. Every time he said it, it's the word sozo, saved. Now, let me read to you out of, this is out of McClinic and Strong. Look up possessed with devils. It's not like it's difficult. Get you a set of McClinic and Strong. It's got so much information in it. Look up the P volume. Look up possessed with devils. Let me read it to you. All right. Possessed with devils. Demonizomai. O I. Demonizomai instead of I. O I. When you see oi, it's always plural. So demonizomai is the same as demonizomai. You're just changing from singular to plural. Let me read it to you. These were persons afflicted with disease or epilepsy. Now, they would say, you have to look at this thing of demons the way the world looked at it in the first century. The world said demons was something different than what God said they were. They lived in superstition. They lived with spells being cast. They were always hiding from somebody, casting a spell, or putting an evil eye on somebody. In that 18th chapter of 1 Samuel, when the women begin to sing, David has slain his ten thousands, and Saul has only slain his thousands, Saul began to put the eye on him. He began to eye David. They call that an evil eye. That didn't originate in comic strips in uh, Hogo or wherever it was. Didn't it originate in that? The evil eye comes out of the ancient world. 
Even the women would hold their babies away. They wouldn't let you look at them real close because they're afraid you're going to put an evil eye on them and make their baby die. Now, it all depended on what the world said that demons was. The world and God. Now, the world said that demons, if you had epilepsy, you had a demon. Except they didn't call it epilepsy. They said if you fell in a fire. They said it was an ancestor that pushed you. The American Indians said when they danced around the fire, a totem pushed them in. If they fell in the fire. They said that sickness was a demon. Sickness. Any kind of disease. If they got a good job, that was a demon. If they lost their job, that was a demon doing the work. If they had ice cream and cake, I don't think they had ice cream back then, but if they had ice cream and cake, that was a good demon. If they broke their leg, that was a bad demon. That's the way they looked at things in the world. God says demons are self. Jesus is God, and he said, Jesus rebuked him, A-U-T-O, in the first in the first chapter of Mark, and the word is self, masculine, gender, singular. Singular. The world said the demons came in hordes. They were vexed with demons. That means they came in great numbers, and they said they were female. Jesus said, no, mister, the, the demon is you. It's self, singular, masculine, gender. Now, you have to understand that Jesus wasn't believing. You know what I believe? Let me read it out of here. I'll get to it. This is possessed with demons. I may have to get to the thing next week on it. Just so much I haven't reviewed on this. Possessed with demons out of Cyclopedia of Biblical, Ecclesiastical, and Theological Literature by John McClinic and James Strong. Great set of encyclopedias. If you don't have a set, look for a set. You can probably find a set on Amazon if you look hard enough for $250, $300. That is dirt cheap. They only print them once every 20 years. The last time they printed them was 2001. The next time will be 2021. And the longer after they print them, they get very scarce and they get higher. They're cheap when they first print them. The last time they printed them were $99.95, all 12 volumes, some of the best encyclopedias you will find you will not you will not uh, exhaust not one of these with the amount of information it has in five lifetimes not one volume it's got 12 volumes the Hastings is the same way they are printed different their information is set up different it's like a chain to Hastings it'll take you from one thing to another you can look up nearly any subject between these two encyclopedias now, let me read this. So, they're saying they were people afflicted with disease. Well, let me just forget, I was going to tell you. When Jesus would say, this kind or these kinfolks go not out by prayer and fasting, do you actually believe Jesus, being God, believed they had one of their ancestors living in them? Not the way they said. Do I have my ancestors living in me that causes me to want to sin? Where did I get this flesh right here? Got it from Harless Brown. He got it from Eugene Brown. And it goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. Do I have my ancestors in me that wants to distribute fortunes? This shows you how close a lie is to the truth. They said an ancestor would come and live in your body. The same thing as a vampire and resurrect you out of the dead and cause you to go to fortunes, either good or bad. Do I have evil in me that causes me to go to try to fulfill my desires? I've got this flesh, and it goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. Yes, I have got. Was Eve a God? Well, yes, she was. She was a little G-O-D. Theos, which means to distribute fortunes. 
or demon means to distribute fortunes. Theos means a judge or a magistrate. God says, thou shalt not. She said, I'll be the God of that. I'll be the judge of that. And she partook of the tree. Jesus said to the Pharisees, have not I said that you're gods? Well, they were magistrates. There's only one capital G-O-D. There's many little G-O-D-S. Many. Many magistrates that judge against the word of God. Let me read this if I can real quick. And especially dumbness, especially with melancholy, insanity, whence the healed are said to be of a sound mind, a sane mind. When you're into yourself, that's true insanity. If you go out here to Central State, where we are, all of our crazy people are, most of them are there because they couldn't live with the world because they tried too hard to have what they wanted. If I could go out there, I would just tell them, look, man, you're not as messed up as you think. All you wanted was what the world wants, and some people can't handle it, and it drives a man crazy. Indeed, while these special disabilities of men in other respects in sound and vigorous health were naturally referred to a supernatural cause, this would be especially the case with the sudden attacks of epilepsy falling at irregular intervals and without any premonition. Like the Greeks and Romans referred to evil spirits taking possessions of men. The case was the same among the ancients. With He's talking about ancient unbelief. He's telling you what they believe. Just listen to it. The case was the same among the ancients with these extraordinary events and achievements accomplished by men, which seemed too great to proceed from the natural human powers. They were referred to the operation of a divinity. There's no divinity beside Christ, is there? By God, except God, Jehovah God. Not only hallucinations, melancholy, and epilepsy, called by Herodotus the sacred disease, but also the ravings of Bacchantes and Carabantes were viewed as proceeding from superhuman inspiration. Hence, to demonize is the common expression meaning to be insane. We just showed that, didn't we? The man came to his right mind. He put on his clothes. What was he doing among the tombs? He thought if he could be around his dead ancestors, they would come and talk to him. That was called necromancy. You believe in demons, you got to study all of this. And they wanted to talk to their dead ancestors. If you wanted to, they've got that on TV, don't they? Those guys that say they'll talk to your dead parents. Those guys are the biggest bunch of liars walking on the face of the earth. Besides Kenneth Copeland. <laughs> talk to the dead, my foot. Whatever that means. That's an old Texas saying. All right. They're not talking to anybody. They talk to the dead by talking to in a bottle. The word bottle in the Old Testament is the word familiar spirit. When you translate the word, when you go into your concordance and you look at the word familiar spirit, you look at the word familiar spirit and you take the number beside beside the familiar spirit and you look it up in the Old Testament. It's an Old Testament word. You look it up in your Hebrew dictionary in the back. It will tell you the word is O-W-B. This whole word, familiar spirit, is one word in the Hebrew, Ob or Ob. It means bottle. That's what it means. Bottle. A bottle to them wasn't what we call a bottle. It wasn't something made out of glass, blown glass. It was a goat's stomach. They would dry it. They would kill a goat, pull out his stomach, dry it, sew up one end, put a stopper in the other, and carry their grape juice and their various drinking water in it. And then when it was empty, if a man was a necromancer or a ventriloquist,
they would master ventriloquism, and when they did that, they would peep and mutter, and they would say that they were talking to a dead ancestor. They would peep, make these high sounds, say, I'm talking to your dead mother in this bottle. When they translated the Septuagint, about 200 B.C., these great authorities, LXX is the word 70, that's the numeral, Roman numeral 70, and anytime you see LXX, it means the Septuagint. Septuagint was the translation of the Hebrew text to Greek around 200 B.C. because the world was being ruled by Alexander the Great's system and he was long dead by then, but his generals were ruling, the Seleucus general, Cassander, Sacamus, and Ptolemy, and then Rome overthrew them. But since there was a Greek culture in the world, they translated the Hebrew to the Greek. That was called the Septuagint. When they translated the word bottle or familiar spirit, they translated E-N-G-A-S-T-R-O. M-U-T-H-O-S. Gastro is the word stomach. Muthos is the word myth. And E-N means within. It means a myth within the stomach. The best translators in the world knew that demons were a myth. 200 B.C. You'll get that out of International Dictionary of Hebrew words. It's a five-volume set I've got in my library at the house. But you've got to be able to look up the Hebrew word. There's no strong numbers in that. I looked up the Hebrew word, bottle, familiar spirit. It says, in gastromuthos, a myth in the stomach. We're talking about 200 B.C. The translators from Hebrew to Greek knew that demons were a myth. That's one of the reasons we don't believe in them. But let me read the rest of this. To demonize meant to be insane. We just said the guy in Luke came to his right mind, didn't we? His sane mind, so for nail, means sane. The Bible says the demons are insanity. If, if you've never been as frustrated as I have when I was in my 20s and I wanted to be a famous singer, I had this big voice and I could sing all these high notes, was riding to church and then somebody gave me a, in fact, Tom was looking for some of my old records on the internet, and he found some. He gave me a uh, gave me a, a a CD of my old group. Somebody found it, and sent it to us, and I had it in there and playing it. And Victor was riding with me. He said, "Boy, that don't sound like you." I said, "No, it doesn't, does it?" But I wanted to be somebody. I wanted to be somebody until it drove me out of my mind. I mean, I got to the point of crazy. That's what wanting money will do. Power. These demons are generally viewed, listen to this. These demons, D-A-E-M-O-N, which is the same word, were generally viewed as the spirits of the deceased. Ancestors. It's all ancestor worship. That's what a vampire is. You look at vampire over there, it'll tell you you caught a vampire in a bottle. That's where you catch a genie, isn't it? In a bottle. You talk to him in a bottle in the ancient world in a familiar spirit. The practice of exorcism upon such men for the purpose of driving out the demons was very common. And do you know when you study all these people, the Celts and the fairies and the Jews and the demons and the Arabs and the genies and the Greeks and the guardian angels, they will all tell you the way you cast out a demon is by sprinkling water on them, holy water or running water or living water. In the vampire section, we're not talking about Bram Stoker. We're talking about vampires goes way into the ancient world. And that the way you kept a vampire at bay, you put him in a casket under running water. And don't the Catholics sprinkle holy water on him? What they do? The practice of exorcism upon such men, all of these people will tell you, you got rid of a demon by water 
baptism. Baptizing people in water got rid of the demon. Well, what is the word baptize? Baptizo and bapto. And bapto. Baptizo means to cover. Bapto means to stain with a dye. Baptize does not mean at all to immerse in water or sprinkle with water. It was a household term. There was no way to translate these words into English, so they anglicized. Angla, Anglo is the word English. They made these words an English word, changed the O to an E, and actually put it over in the English language. These are not baptized. It's not an English word. It's a Greek word. that They, they had no word for it because... It had a dual meaning to cover something to stain and to die. That's a term that women use for staining and dyeing clothes. Well, what is a blood baptism? It's death to self, isn't it? And if self is the demon, then a blood baptism drives the demon out. And they said a water baptism did it over here. Can you see that? Notice how closely aligned truth is with a lie. Oh, hey, I think I remember something. <laughs> hey, there's a light bulb over my head. Mark them which cause divisions and offenses that are contrary to the doctrines that ye have learned and avoid these people. Avoid contrary doctrine. Contrary doesn't mean something that's exactly opposite. The word is para. We get our word parallel. Parallel, it runs right alongside the truth, just like this baptism. A blood baptism drives out self, doesn't it? Well, they said a water baptism drove out the demon. That's how far off baptism is. We don't believe in baptism here. Not water. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism in Ephesians 4 and 5. He's washed us from our sins in his own blood if he's in Revelation 1 and 5. Well, if he's washed us from our sins in his own blood, the one baptism is blood. It's not water. People want to bring baptism into the church, water, that are associated with grace and truth. It's not coming in here. We ain't never dipping anybody in water and sprinkling the water on them unless... They get a vampire in them, and we'll sprinkle holy water on them. You say, why do you make fun of that? For the same reason Elijah made fun of the priests of Baal. He said, perhaps your God is asleep. That's why he won't answer you. Maybe he's on a journey. He's talking to another God. If you yell louder, you can get his attention. That's the way I feel about these preachers that lie. They don't study. This is why we don't believe in demons. They're not true. It's all if Babylon's the mother of harlots, and she is, Revelation 17 and 5, and Babylon was founded on self, let us make us a name. Let us make us a name. Shem, authority. The Bible says this they begin to do. Once a man says, let us make up our own doctrine, of demons and fairies and genies and Celts. The Bible says after that, read it over here with me. Go to Genesis 11. Read this with me. I want you to see something. I want you to mark in your Bible. Here's what happens when a man makes up his own doctrine of demons. Baptism. <sighs> they found a plain in the land of Shinar. They took, took brick and mortar, and they said, verse 4, Come now, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven, and let us make us a name. That's their doctrine. Lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men had built and said, Behold, the people is one. They have one, all one language. This they begin to do. And now, nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Once they do this, he says their imagination 
is going to get crazy. Is this imagination? Celts and fairies and demons and genies and guardian angels and patron saints and totems. It's imagination. The wickedest thing in the world, according to Jeremiah 17, I believe it's verse 9, is a man's heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. It's deceitful above all things. I said it several times in the last few weeks. If there is such a thing as a demon, a demon would be a sissy upside your heart before your conversion. That's what's deceitful above everything that's ever existed is man's heart, isn't it? If there's such thing as a demon, I'm going to name him Casper, Casper the friendly demon, because he ain't as wicked as man. Isn't that right? And what does is, what is Matthew, the, the fifth chapter, say about the heart? Out of, you think there's something more wicked than your heart? That's why God's got to take away our stony heart and give us a heart of flesh. Our hearts are calloused. Look here in Matthew, the 15th chapter. Did I say 15? Huh? No, I didn't mean that. I meant 15. You ought to know that by now. <laughs> but these things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart. They defile a man. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. To eat with unwashing hands defileth not a man. And the scripture says that it's not what enters a man that defiles him. It's what comes out of his heart. That's the problem. If you can blame it on a demon and say with Flip Wilson, the devil made me do it, then you don't have to repent. Whoever Flip Wilson was. <laughs> For the young people that don't know. He was a black comedian years ago. And he's always saying, the devil made me do it. Well, the devil didn't make you do it. When man is drawn away of his own lust, he's enticed of his own flesh. And God put you in that flesh so you would be. Now, why we, let me read some more of this on possessed with demons. I want you to pay attention to this right here. Many suppose that Jesus simply adopted the popular mode of speech in his age, speaking of demons, demonic possession, and healed the unfortunate sufferers without sharing in the view commonly taken of their disease. This is saying, the world said it was a demon. Jesus would say, okay, you can call it a demon, if that's what you want to call it. And I will say, this kind goeth not out. Do you believe that Jesus believed that they were being possessed with ancestors when he is the inspired word of God. And in inspired word of God, he says, when you die, like the rich man in Luke 17 chapter, and in hell he lift up his eyes, and Lazarus to be carried to Abraham's bosom. And, and to be absent with the bodies, to be present with the Lord in the fifth chapter of 2 Corinthians. Do you believe that Jesus believed they had ancestors when he knew their ancestors were either in heaven or in hell? No, they didn't have ancestors. The only ancestor you have living in you is that lust of that flesh you live in. That's the demon that wants to distribute all the things in the world to self. And then I'll read some more of this. How much time do I have, Mike? Oh, me. I was going to get back. I'm going to get back to why demons, why fallen angels are not, are not demons. They're not sons of God. To be a son of God to be a son of anyone, you had to be doing the will of that father. Jesus told the Pharisees, your father's the devil. You're sons of Satan. People try to make these fallen angels sons of God. It's impossible for them to be because they wasn't doing the will of the father, were they? Son of, blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, son of Jonah. Peter was the spiritual son of Jonah the prophet because Jonah preached 
he went and preached to Nineveh after he was resurrected from the belly of the fish. He preached repentance to Nineveh, the capital city. That's what I started a while ago. He preached repentance to Nineveh, the capital city of the Assyrian Empire. When he preached that repentance, that's what Peter preached, wasn't it? He preached repentance in Pentecost to the, to the Jews and preached repentance at the house of Cornelius. I had heard one preacher say, now Peter goes down here to Joppa and gets on a boat out and goes out here in the Mediterranean. Nineveh's over here. It's on the Tigris River, about where Baghdad is, about 700 miles from the coast here. And I heard a preacher say, it shows you how ignorant they are, they don't look at maps. He said, and Jonah was out there on the Mediterranean Sea and, and the whale vomited him up, and I believe he vomited him up on the very shores of Nineveh. Well, if he did, he went flying through the air about 700 miles. The whale goes, Pooey! and he goes, somebody says, look, up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's Jonah. <laughs> look at the maps, you guys. Quit saying these stupid things. He would have swam over here around Africa, go down here around the Cape of Good Hope and come up into the, come up around the Indian Ocean then come up in here to the Persian Gulf and come up here and spit him out right there. But that would have taken longer than three days for a whale to swim that far, wouldn't it? <laughs> if you study maps like we do, you'll hear some guy say something. I say, oh, good grief. And I believe he spit him up on the shores of Nineveh there. Not without shooting him through the air like a cannon. <laughs> Aren't people funny? Let me read some of the rest of this. As the uh, let me see here, the physicians in the time of origin who did not all believe in real possession of demons, where prayer and fasting are recommended to the apostles as a means of exorcism, Jesus said, "This kind, these kin folks." Do not go out but by prayer and fasting. Prayer is the word prosukomai. It comes from pros and UK. It means to will toward the will of another. So if you start buying to the will of God, that's when self is going out, isn't it? There was only one fast in Israel. One. That was an official fast. That was on the Day of Atonement. Atonement is the sprinkling of the Ark of the Covenant, and our hearts are sprinkled, and that's a blood baptism, isn't it? When our hearts are sprinkled, that's when the demon of self goes out. And on the Day of Atonement, that they had to afflict the soul. That was called the fast of the Day of Atonement. The word is one word, N-A-Q-I-Y. Afflict. It means to humble self. Humble self. When you humble self on the Day of Atonement or the Day of Baptism, isn't that when our hearts are sprinkled? And the law is written in fleshy tables of our hearts and it was written on tables of stone over here. And that ark was sprinkled. And God had to look through the blood of the lamb, of the goat that was actually blood was offered on the ark on the day of the atonement, the tenth day of the seventh month, and the sins of the people forgiven. On that day, self was atoned for. That's the day of blood baptism. A blood baptism is death to self. And we have to humble ourselves. And the true fast is illustrated in Isaiah, the 58th chapter. It's giving up self. That's why we don't believe in demons. This and a whole lot more. I don't have enough time to go through everything on this. I'll let me read a little, couple other things. In Latin, the epileptics were called lunatici or moonstruck. And the man comes to Jesus in the 17th chapter of Matthew and says, My son is lunatic, lunar, moonstruck. Do you actually believe the man was lunar struck? Do you actually believe them? The man was living in a superstitious world. Where did he get the idea he was moonstruck? 
that was his own imagination. He'd been listening to all of this all around him for all of his life. And he said, he's moonstruck. What's moonstruck? What, what things are moonstruck? Werewolves. That's called lycanthropy. In the ancient world, that was men turning themselves into animals. That's called shape-shifting. That's what, yeah, gosh, I ain't got time to go there. Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table are a thinly veiled sun and tree deities. And Merlin was the picture of Satan. He was said to be able to change himself into a wolf. And that's all imagination, isn't it? And Arthur pulls the sword out of the stone and crushes the stone, and the sword is the word of God. He was said to be the savior of the land, and the land and the sword and Arthur were together, and that was the savior and the word of God. It was a convolution of truth. Mythology is a convolution of Jesus. I preached on the gospel and the stars. That's the Maseroth, or what we call the Zodiac today. And each one of them has a decon, and there's certain, certain signs in the decons. And you have coma, and that is the virgin with the babe in her lap. That's a picture of Christ. You have Virgo, which is the virgin. You have Christ coming back as a lion. That's the sphinx, head of a lion. The body of a lion, the head of a man. It's all of that is imagination. It is man's. This they begin to do, and now nothing will, will be restrained from their imagination. All of this is mythology. I studied the Bible from the time I was about 16, 17 till I was 40. And I woke up one day and I said, Oh my goodness. Nobody told me. I didn't know who celebrated Christmas and who didn't. And I started defining Baal and the Grove and Shemash and Molech, and I realized they were sun gods, and their birthday was December the 25th. And I said, oh, my goodness. I started getting scared. I said, I think, I think we're involved in Roman and Greek God worship with this thing called Christmas and Easter. Oh, man. I got scared by studying it. Nobody told me. I called this professor at Washington Bible Institute in Washington, D.C., I knew they were a real conservative college, and he was one of the head history professors. I said, uh, Dr. So-and-so, I believe we're involved in Greek and Roman God worship with, it's all imagination, with this thing called Christmas and Easter. And he said, what you need is a set of books. He answered me immediately. Because Cyclopedia, a biblical, theological, and ecclesiastical literature by John McClinic and James Strong, and he said, you need a book called The Two Babylons. And he hung up. This got me on my way. I was already familiar with the gods of the Old Testament. That was 34 years ago. And I began, I came home one day and I said, Mary, we're not doing this Christmas anymore. I don't know who does it and who don't do it, but we're not doing it. It's one of the best things that ever happened to our life. We don't get in that stupid traffic and go down here to Rivergate and see people getting fights over the last toy or the last cabbage head doll or whatever they are. <laughs> cabbage patch. Cab <laughs> but they're a bunch of cabbage heads, aren't they? We don't get in that. We don't go out and spend money that's unnecessary. And young couples here at Grace and Truth, they say, I couldn't celebrate Christmas if we... If you still did it, because we don't have the money. Isn't that a waste of time to do something that's going to cost you money that you don't have? Isn't that ignorant? This is one of the reasons. These are some of the reasons I've got so much on all this. I ought to make copies of, I've made copies of a lot of stuff and given to all of you. And... It's amazing to me how little people know about the truth. We're, we ain't never going to believe in demons. I'm going to tell you the problem is you. You're the demon. You have to repent of self. You have to be blood baptized for the demon to start dying. But he dies hard. He don't die easy, does he? Takes a lifetime, like we said this morning, to be perfected in Christ and to be mature and grow up and get rid of the demon of I want. There's nothing more evil than the heart of a man. 
Like I said, if demons were real, they're not as bad as you are. You can boss them around and tell them what to do. Cast for the friendly demon. I need to need to title this message, Cast for the Friendly Demon. I, I wish I could tell you everything that there is to know. I've got tons and tons of material on this, and I can't impart it the way I want to. I, I feel like I'm just throwing stuff at you. Here's some information. Here's some more. Here's some more. Here's some more. Here's some more. Here, go through all that. And people want to say, we believe in demons. It's because you hadn't studied it. You've got to keep remembering, Jesus didn't say they had demons. They said they had demons. They lived in a superstitious world. Even the apostles believed in demons. At first, and Jesus said, oh, ye of little faith. Oh, ye of little death to self. Oh, ye of, you're not dying much yet. They believed in demons because when they saw him on the water, they said, it's a, it's a spirit. And they used the word phantasm, which was a demon in the first century. The apostles believed in him, and Jesus said, no, it's me. Ain't no demons out here. And there was reason they said it about him walking on the water because they believed that the Mediterranean Sea and the Sea of Galilee, they believed demons lived in the water. They all believed that the Mediterranean Sea was full of demons. They called whales demons. Boy, I'm said all I need to say tonight. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. Help us, Lord, to see these truths and that our problem is us. We can't blame it on anybody but our own selves. Deal with our hearts. Crush us under your hand. We'll praise you and glorify you for everything. Lead us to your elect. Encourage us. Meet our needs, Lord. We just, sometimes I get so depressed, I don't know what to do, Lord, with a world that don't believe the truth. We'll praise you for all things and glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, I'll resume next week on On sons of God, marrying daughters of men. I see why you review. Because when you review, you see things that you didn't see before. Oh, yeah. I, I'm constantly learning these and things. I just learned just now when you were just saying.